you could strike it. Or you could say there, uh, there is another option. Well, I think actually you could strike it because we're talking about the regional agreement, not, I think, you know, that was in reference to the building committee. Okay. Uh, you know, and on the second page, whenever you're talking about uh, the enterprise funds, you say expended revenues and then gain. I, um, I wish I, I'd take out gain and put in projected surplus. Just, you know, so because that's what it is. It's a projected surplus. So whenever you, whenever you have the, uh, there's two of them that I see. Okay, are there any other corrections? Okay. Oh, uh, do I have a motion on the minutes as corrected? Second? Second. Okay, any further discussion or corrections? All those in favor of accepting the minutes as corrected, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, done. So I just say that um, all four of the um, enterprise funds are on here, so I've changed the now and we have to make on all four of them. Right. Okay, uh, before we get started, uh, um, the governor presented his budgets today. Uh, and so uh, uh, it, it came out pretty good for cities and towns, and I think it came out very good for Arlington. Uh, so in, on the spreadsheets, the manager had, he had an increase of 321000 for local aid and left. How much does that have? 768. So, like, it's two and a half times. So, uh, 3768, so call it 450,000 or something like that difference. And, you know, while it's not a massive amount, you know, if that becomes the base going forward, you're talking 450 this year, next year, the year after. So, you're talking a uh, million eight over four years. Uh, and we're trying to get that deficit down. Uh, actually, uh, say two million one over five years. We're trying to get that deficit down in five mm -hmm. years. That's a good chunk right there. So um, now the question is: Is it going to get by the House and the Senate? So I would recommend. Uh, first of all, you can go online and see what it see the governor's recommendation. If you uh, um, if you go online to Cherry Sheets on Division of Local Services and it goes to Cherry Sheets Fiscal 16, and it has last year's, and then it has the governor's, and then the House is going to come, and the Senate, and the final. Obviously, those three are blank. But get a hold of that. Take a look at it. There really, there's only two that matter. It is the general government assistance and the Chapter 70. Uh, and both of those are higher than I, I think we had projected. So if you have the, have the opportunity of uh, seeing any of our state reps or senators or their assistance, uh, I think, uh, you know, supporting that and hope the House and then later the Senate supports the governor's recommendations. Unless they want to put more in, but I doubt that's going to happen. Um, so it's going to be interesting to, uh, um, to see how this all plays out. Um, okay. Gloria, do we have our people here from... <coughs> want to come up here? How many do we have? Three? Four. Four. Thank you. Now, the purpose here is just to get a preview on the uh, master plan. Uh, not the whole master hand plan, but sort of focusing on the, the finances and things like that. And uh, um, for the finance committee, obviously our interest. And uh, you can ask questions or give feedback or whatever you want. meeting members, and I'm also handing out the implementation table 
from the master plan. It details the tasks that follow to actually get the master plan accomplished. So I want, to have, want you to have those in hand as we get started. I'm Carol Kowalski, I'm Director of Planning and Community Development. Charlie Kalowski is co-chair of the Master Plan Advisory Committee. Carol Swenson, co-chair of the committee. Ted Fields, Economic Development Director. And if it's okay. Okay, um, okay. do you want to give any overview or general thoughts? If we could take um, maybe 10 minutes, 15 sure. minutes, <coughs> sort yep. of an overview. Um, and I know many of you probably were either contacted through the master planning process or attended some of the meetings, so I really thank you for uh, your input. It's really valuable. Um, Carol will be talking a little bit about the process in more detail, but I thought I'd start by just saying um, that this really, a master plan is really a document, a living document, if you will, um, that really is a statement of, of the town's future physical development. And that has fiscal implications, and I think that's why we're here tonight to talk about how physical development can have a positive impact on uh, the town finances. Um, the, the process began um, several years ago, um, World Cafe, and we've gone through quite a bit of um, analysis of the town's existing conditions, both physically and fiscally, um, during the process. And what we want to say is that, the, that this is the beginning of a process that we're going to have to go through in terms of implementation. We'll be touching on that a little bit later. But we thought we'd spend a little bit of time talking about what is in the uh, master plan document. Um, our consultant, uh, RKG Associates, had some independent observations about the town. Independent observations were the town is very well managed. They were very impressed with the fact that we had a five-year uh, plan um, for our town finances um, and that there's a lot of opportunity in town for future economic development that can help the town um, in terms of its future budgeting. Um, we'll be talking about that in a little in a little while. The town has changed significantly since I um, moved to Arlington in 1976. Um, there's been quite a change in terms of um, development been changes in terms of demographics. Um, Arlington's a very desirable place to live today. Housing prices are, are going up faster than the region as a whole. Um, our schools are excellent, um, have an excellent reputation. We have great <coughs> recreation facilities, cultural resources, and we think we're poised for um, a, a change in terms of um, how the town may see development occur, and we want to talk a little bit about um, how that may happen. Um, I want to just take a minute, if you can turn to the, the third page vision statement for the town. This is really important because um, this is what guided us through the process. Um, and that the theme here is the civic connections um, throughout town. Um, that encourage social interaction. And social interaction is really what brings us together as a town. Um, the fact that we've remained a town and not turned into a different form of government, I think is admirable. And we want to continue that. And we think a lot of that has to do with the connections that we all have to one another and, and, and um, throughout town. But the vision statement talks about <coughs> that um, we want to contribute to preservation of open spaces and corridors that link neighborhoods. We want to promote uh, thriving business districts, the three major business districts that we have now, you know, being you know, around Capitol Square in East Arlington, in Arlington Center, and in the Heights. Um, providing living and working opportunities for all. Um, we know that um, parts of Arlington are, are becoming unaffordable for, for some. It's, some. it's an issue that has to be addressed. Um, and more local employment. And we believe that local employment, um, especially th after this winter, uh, last month or so, I think people would rather have local employment than the commutes they're uh, putting up with these days. Um, we, we believe that um, we have an obligation as, as stewards of our historic 
uh, heritage, and we want to also promote that. There may be some economic benefits from promoting um, uh, tourism uh, along the Battle Road. Um, that, that march out uh, from, from Charlestown to Lexington Concord, they get all the publicity, they had to go through Monotomy um, on their way there. Um, cultural and, res and, and recreational resources, um, it was those provide the shared experiences I mentioned before and the connections. And then um, our natural system, Spy Pond, the topography, the views you get from the hills of Arlington, all those need to be preserved. Um, walkability is, is key. Uh, you'll, you'll read throughout that. We're becoming more of a walking community. Um, and then the last is, um, and, and most important to this committee, is the shared interest in community-wide fiscal health. So with that, I um, just want to have you turn to the economic development section. Master plan is on page uh, four, correct? Hold that open. Um, as I said before, Arlington is primarily a bedroom community. People commute to the employment centers in Boston and Cambridge or commute to 128. Um, and our tax base has been decreasing over time because the jobs are out along 128, as I said, or in the <coughs> urban, urban core area. Um, what we need in town are more businesses to remain locally and promote that. Um, but we have very little vacant land left to develop. So some of the recommendations that we're making, there are a series of six here, there are more in the, uh, in the full document. But making some changes to the zoning bylaw that would allow some flexibility in, in, uh, in business districts, and that would help promote uh, more economic development. Um, current market trends, um, are showing that there's more shared um, uh, space for employment. We'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of innovative companies. Um, so the industrial district zoning may, may need to be amended. Um, new office uh, buildings and are an innovation park. Um, I think the truth is that Arlington's not going to be a magnet for 100, 200,000 square foot office building. Those are happening in Burlington or, as I said before, Cambridge, Boston. And we don't have the land for, for large buildings like that. <coughs> so they're going to be smaller office buildings, probably more geared towards medical um, or professional services. Um, collaborative workspaces. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in Arlington. Many people have their own companies, maybe they're startups or um, in, in what we call the knowledge industry, trying to capture uh, the talent and have that stay in Arlington. And maybe they are a smaller business to begin with, but they grow over time. And then supporting our magnet businesses. We did a study, um, the town did a study not too long ago about the importance of theaters and entertainment restaurants and building that is one of the magnets, <coughs> not the only one for, town, uh, for the town. Um, and then last is um, implementing a lot of the recommendations of a commercial center uh, report that was done back in 2009. So those are a summary of the recommendations, and Carol and Ted will go into more detail about those a little bit later. And Carol, maybe you want to talk about the process. Yes, I would like to talk about the process. And one of the things that came out of the two-year process were these vision statements. And one thing I must say is the goal, I believe, of the town and the master planning committee was to try to get as most public input as we can from Arlington. We really wanted to know what everyone thought, what would make this a better town, and we did this in a lot of ways. In October, let's see, two years ago, 2012, we had a World Cafe that just said, what do you see? What do you want Arlington to be? We had good attendance for that. And from there, the town had decided on a master plan um, advisory committee, which how many do we have now, 11? 11 members. 11 members, some of those are town meeting members. Most of those people have uh, experience in either transportation or um, economic development. So it was a wide crowd. And from that, we had about 75 meetings, um, 
public workshops, presentations, interviews, surveys went out <coughs> to get the public input. People, I feel, had as many chances as they could to input and tell us what they wanted. And from there, we started writing the master plan. By, in January, well, let me not skip ahead so much. We started writing it. We wrote the different sections that you see you know, briefly in your handout, because by law, we need to have those sections. But they also do cover and overlap a lot of what we feel are good recommendations for the town, and we feel this from the public input. So once we had all that together and we wrote a draft, in January, we went to the redevelopment board to have a, and they had a hearing formally considering adoption of the master plan. Now by state law, the ARB has the authority to hold this hearing and adopt the plan for the town. On February 4th, that plan was adopted. <coughs> now from there, we've taken comments that have come from them and have done a little more like this pamphlet with the master plan because we'd like to bring it to town meeting. We have a warrant article on the meeting agenda. Because we want their endorsement. They're the ones that approve zoning changes. They're the ones that talk about whatever um, changes that would be to the town. So we want them to well help with have it implemented. So on um, town meeting day in <coughs> April, we will be presenting that with the hope that they will consider to accept, receive, or resolve to endorse the master plan. So that was a quick overview. Now I'd like to pass it on to the Ben or Carol about increasing the tax base. Um, I can um, begin to talk about that a little bit about um, in the master plan. You'll see um, you'll see what I'm about to, to tell you. Um, after the recession of the 1990s, Arlington's commercial property values dropped significantly and adjusted for inflation have not yet fully recovered. If we wanted to achieve even like an 8% share, right now we're about 6% um, of our tax base is commercial, industrial. If we wanted to achieve an 8%, it would require almost twice the amount of commercial floor space that exists today. That would be like adding the equivalent of another story of space to each commercial structure in town. So that's not likely to happen, at least it's not likely to happen overnight. But we do have a lot of underutilized sites in Arlington. Any development, almost any development you're going to see in the near term is going to be redevelopment of underutilized sites. And we do have areas of town, I think everyone can pick one or two that you, if when you think about it, you realize that there's, there's a potential for redevelopment. We do need to adjust our zoning. The uh, consultant opines that we have capacity, even in our existing zoning, to increase density along Mass Ave. Based on a visual preference survey that we did with the public, too, we gathered some conclusions that we could go taller in some locations in our commercial areas. Uh, there are a lot of single story commercial uh, buildings, um, mid uh, early 20th century commercial buildings that really could stand to have a little more heft. In fact, we were interested to see, there was an article in The Advocate from a long time ago. Uh, I wish I had my hands on it tonight for you. But it was an editorial <coughs> criticizing these one-story buildings that were being built in the early 1900s because they weren't grand. They, they weren't of any kind of stature. They weren't made of grand <coughs> materials or grand scale. So it's kind of ironic that there was a time when suburbs like Arlington, their trajectory was they wanted to, to grow and be significant. But then there was a trend where upper floors were taxed at a higher rate, and there was a trend where the upper floors were removed from buildings in Arlington and in some of the other outer suburbs. So these things ebb and flow, but we did this visual preference survey showing 
some of you might have attended it. It was last summer, late summer. And uh, presenting slides of examples of buildings in Arlington and some that were not in Arlington. And we were kind of pleasantly surprised to see that there was more of it, much more of a tolerance for increasing density than we thought. When we say increasing density, we're not talking about 12 story or 20 story skyscrapers, but even four or five story buildings, adding a couple stories over existing stories or redeveloping on, on existing blocks. So I'm not gonna tell you that we're, we're going to um, put forth this idea that increase in commercial development is gonna solve all of our fiscal problems. But we do have the capacity to increase that over time a little bit and potentially increasing the demand. Because if we increase the demand for commercial properties and industrial properties and office space here, that's what will increase the valuation <coughs> of that whole class of, of buildings. It's also just very good for Arlington's quality of life. You don't want a monoculture of uses or buildings or building types. Uh, so we have a variety of, the, by the way, the implementation schedule that we distributed tonight is still in draft form. The final, with the revisions, we're expecting to try to post next week. You'll see that it also includes, uh, as Charlie said, a uh, recommendation to allow and encourage office space uh, or an innovation center. We aren't gonna have one the size Lexington would have or walk in, but we can scale this to Arlington. Uh, so that's, um, I'd be happy to take some questions on uh, growth of the tax base, but we also wanna talk a little bit about um, the economic development themes um, and Ted's going to talk a little bit about mixed use and why <coughs> we're, um, why the plan promotes mixed use. Thank you, Carol. Uh, as uh, my predecessors have alluded, uh, this plan uh, that has been developed uh, really uh, puts forth uh, the concept of mixed use development, encouraging mixed use development along Massachusetts Avenue and Broadway, especially where the town's business districts are concentrated as a means of not only uh, boosting the utility and value of our existing commercial properties that we want to protect and enhance and uh, increase the value of into the future uh, to provide more fiscal benefits to the town, uh, but also to provide more utility to residents. Uh, throughout this process, we talk to residents about what they want to see in the future and uh, without fail, a lot of them have told us continually they want to see more shops, more different types of shops, more different types of businesses in town. They like patronizing local businesses, local service providers, and promoting uh, zoning changes that will allow existing commercial <coughs> properties to be flexibly reused and redeveloped to provide better services to future residents. Uh, is key to enhancing their value and making them work for the town uh, in a better way in the future. And we see mixed use development, which is very similar to what we see in the Capitol Square Block where the Capitol Theater is. It's not just a theater. It shares that whole building with ground floor shops and restaurants. And then above, in the upper stories, are apartments three different types of uses that are providing a lot of uh, useful qualities to the town. And in our visual preference <coughs> survey, residents pointed to that Capitol Theater block as the most popular type of building and a popular type of development they want to see in the future. That is kind of the model for what residents want to see along Massachusetts Avenue and Broadway in the future. That type of mixed use, about three, maybe four stories, but uh, you know, with very uh, visible storefronts and uh, you know, less intrusive residences above. But that type of use, it's not anything new, it's not anything wild, it's really returning to our roots and promoting that along in our business districts and along our business corridors. I'm gonna interject if I may. Uh, right now, mixed use is allowed in Arlington's zoning bylaw. And in one of the <coughs> district descriptions, it's even encouraged. But if you are a developer or a property owner and you sit down to look at our bylaw to figure out 
how you're going to develop a, or design a mixed use building on your property, you very quickly realize that you can't do it because our bylaw tells you that you have to provide all of the requirements for commercial use plus all of the on-site requirements for the residential use. So if you need to provide X number of parking spaces for your residential uses, you also have to provide the same, the amount of parking spaces you need for the square footage of retail you're proposing. So on Arlington sites, is that gonna happen? No, that's not gonna happen. We have buses, we have, we have pretty good bus service, and most of our most prized commercial buildings don't have any on-site parking. So there's a kind of a paradox in our zoning bylaw, which we know we would have to address to, to really make mixed use happen. So don't let anyone tell you it's not allowed by our current bylaw or encouraged by our, cu our current bylaw, but when the rubber hits the road, we've got to amend the bylaw to really make true mixed use allowed and encourage it. So I wanted to add that to clarify that. Sure, well we not only think that uh, this mixed use concept uh, can really help uh, preserve our commercial properties and enhance our commercial tax base. But another theme that we uh, stress in the plan is to uh, generate and promote thriving business districts and mixed use development in our business districts by providing a residential base of people who are coming and going to live in these business districts can really promote uh, a better streetscape on there, a better street life on there, people coming and going at different hours, making them active, vibrant places. Uh, that, that, that can really help uh, in, in doing that. Um, and that type of activity will make our business districts more attractive to outsiders to come in and visit, uh, to visit our cultural attractions, and blah, 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 uh, to visit our historical properties, which is another pr part of our plan. We wanna bring visitors into town to patronize our, uh, our, attractive, uh, our attractions and uh, having vibrant business districts helps to do that. So mixed use development has a lot of added benefits beyond just enhancing the value of our commercial properties uh, right now. Ted's worked a lot over the last couple of years uh, trying to introduce to Arlington landlords and property owners the idea of shared workspaces, which have caught on very well in uh, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, but uh, landlords in the outer suburbs, it's, it's kind of new to them and it's a little risky. They don't, it's, it's unfamiliar to them. So uh, Ted's pulled together a couple forums, bringing together venture capital people, um, entrepreneurs, uh, landlords, and real estate agents to hear panelists who've done this elsewhere, who can tell Arlington landlords how to do this. We do see the, the innovation economy and the <coughs> startups as a viable niche, industrial niche for Arlington in the future because our labor force, our, our residents are working in tech. They are very um, very highly trained and highly skilled. Uh, so this would be a way of trying to better match the population to the office space and types of workspaces available. Um, I wanna get back to mixed use just for one more moment. When you're thinking about, when we think about mixed use, we're really trying to harness this really hot real estate market in order to get more business use. Uh, pure business use would be terrific. That would be the best net return to the town and cost the least in services. So, but at the same time, we have uh, demographic changes where our older adults, that's, that, um, <coughs> Demographic is increasing and projected to go up, and young adults. Both of those need smaller units. Empty nesters kind of want to downsize. And young adults, they just want to get a foothold. They, they, they want to get that first home or even apartment or condo. But the market's not making those. So the idea with these mixed use units is that's what we, we could get smaller units potentially out of the mixed use scenario <coughs> and, and try to leverage that hot real estate market by saying you can get that, you, you, you'll get permission to build that, but only if you also put in that business use. Or, uh, you know, the typical one is, is stores on the first floor and apartments above, but 
I don't think we want to be a slave to that format necessarily. Uh, the uses are going to come to us, and nowadays we don't have a lot of noisy, smelly, industrial uses. They're quieter, there's no odor, so I, I wouldn't <coughs> even say that we'd want to necessarily segregate uh, light industry from residential, depending on how it's designed. Well, I'd, I'd really break in an example of that are um, artist lofts where you have live workspace and, and uh, gallery space. Uh, so you have kind of a retail component, an industrial component, and a, a residential component all combined uh, in one space. Uh, so that would be uh, the type of thing we'd want to encourage in our zoning going forward, especially uh, if we want to try to develop our creative economy uh, based around the arts and uh, performance arts, visual arts that are very strong here in Arlington. Mm -hmm. uh, and our existing commercial spaces are great uh, venues for um, developing those and showcasing those types of activities. Um, so we have to give property owners a, uh, an incentive to um, redevelop their properties to accommodate those types of activities. And mixed use is a way of allowing them to tap into the, uh, the hot residential markets while maintaining um, 21st century commercial space. So just to try to wrap up and then uh, we'll take questions. Uh, the Final version of the master plan is expected to be on the website next week. Uh, the Article 46 will ask town meeting to endorse the master plan. The master plan is already adopted, but there's so much work that would have to go back to town meeting. We want to really uh, become partners with town meeting and ask town meeting members to embrace the plan and look forward to a future process to bring some of this uh, to fruition. So uh, if you have any questions on the resolution draft language or on anything you've heard tonight or the uh, summary, we'd be happy to try to address your question. Okay. Questions from the committee? Charlie? excited about the concept of mixed use because and focusing on it because that's one of the only ways that we are going to get any increased commercial revenues in the town and, and try to alleviate the burden on the residential tax credit a little bit as the, as the town moves forward. And maybe I don't know if it'll ever completely address our structural deficit, but it might it might help. But um, I just have one one question that's concerns me. You know I've been in town meetings since and I've seen um, <coughs> the immense pain that developers have to go through to do almost anything on what, what Are you doing anything that is going to somehow change the, the ground rules so that people, you know, how, how does somebody come in and do one of these projects if, if they have to go through 97 hoops in two years and, and <coughs> you know, bankruptcy and whatever else is in the process? To, get something done. I can try to address that a little bit. I appreciate that question because it's kind of close to my heart. In the land use section, uh, you'll see a kind of critique. We asked the consultant to critique our zoning. Uh, and one of the observations is that too many uses in Arlington go through special permits. Mm -hmm. uh, special permit process, I think the boards that administer it in Arlington, I work closely with one of them, I think they're fair, they do a good job. Yet, despite that, it costs <laughs> A developer, time and uncertainty, and I think it, it has a kind of a chilling effect on expansion. It might have a chilling effect on uh, new businesses coming here. We're not the only community that has special permit or or site plan review, but I do think that um, there is this sense that you don't want to go to Arlington because you, you might have to go through, that, through a special permit. You might have to go through environmental design review. Even if you want to expand, there's always going to be someone who thinks, why, <coughs> why didn't that business go through environmental design review? There are some people who think everything should, but our consultant, and I, 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 I agree that we have, we have to make something allowed 
more things allowed by our budget. And one of the ways we can do that is by a design guidelines, I believe. We are uh, undertaking uh, an effort very right away to see if we can come up with design guidelines with community input that will be incorporated into the <coughs> changes so that the public will have some idea in advance before we even change the zoning of what things might look like. I don't, I'm not talking about paint color, but the massing, where it might go on the street, how it might take advantage of the site. If these design guidelines are adopted and there's a, ro a good, robust public process, I think it would help the public reduce their anxiety about new development coming in, thereby encourage them to say, well, if, it's going, if we know already what it's going to look like, we, it doesn't have to go through spe a special permit. Then I think there'll be more, uh, the way will be paved to adjust the zoning, to amend the zoning, so that we don't have so many special permit uses. Does that help a little bit? There are some, there is also a recommendation to recodify the zoning and to overhaul our zoning wholesale. Uh, our zoning was adopted in 1974, and uh, it followed a, a, a good planning process in its day, but think of how much has changed since 1974 in the world, in our population in Arlington, and on the ground in Arlington. Uh, a zoning bylaw is supposed to reflect what is going on in the town. It's not supposed to be something that's locked in like the Ten Commandments and we don't <coughs> change it. It's time for us to, to update our zoning to 2014, not, not 1974. You seem to be changing the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> I chose a bad example, didn't I? <laughs> One, one of the things that the committee also discussed is the role of technology. I mean, technology is changing so rapidly. Um, we think today you may have to wait for the MBTA bus, number 77 bus on Mass Ave. In a few years, it may be some sort of Uber or Lyft or some other service that's getting people around. Um, the power of mobile communications is just extraordinary. And that has to be taken into consideration as well in terms of looking in the future, looking down the road. So we touch on that a little bit in the, uh, in the master plan, but um, who knows what's coming down the road. We have to be adaptable and flexible. Okay. Ken? Carol, you might have an insight in this. B is out in, at least it happened here, on, on the population growth, there have been all types of people blue collar workers, white collar workers, low, high, and so forth, all kinds of people. And there's been a great mixture of these people throughout the town. But the last year or two, we see the sales of real estate, and many dollars is like nothing now. And we see asking prices that are 50, 75, lately 150,000 over the asking price for homes. Mm -hmm. Now these are limited people who can come into this town. You're not going to get the average blue collar worker paying that much money for a house or even a low white collar worker. Are we in danger of becoming a town only for the rich? It's almost too late. <laughs> I hate to say it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm overstating it, but Arlington has gotten wealthier. If you look at the um, <coughs> comparative wealth tables, the upper um, and uh, the highest and the second highest are much larger cohorts now than they were. Um, 10 years ago. Uh, every time a property changes hands and value is put into that property, it's now priced where only the people who sold it wouldn't be able to afford it. So over time, and you've seen this trend happening for, I've been here since 86. So. Uh, and you know there was there was the recession and then the boom in the 90s and then it, it continued into the um, 2000s and it's recovered a lot. The housing market here has recovered a lot since the recession. It's just it's just been this trajectory that hasn't gone down. Our our values stayed stable during the downturn, and a lot of properties were getting above the asking price even during the recession. I would tell Sims developers, prospective Sims developers at that time when we were still trying to get Sims developed, they, wouldn't, they didn't believe it because they were from out of town, out of the region, but 
we saw it. You knew what was happening. Um, so you you phrased it, Kenny. Like, are we in danger? I, I, it's a it's a pattern that the local government can't really affect. It's a pattern that I don't know if individual property owners want to affect. You can understand an individual individual property owner wants to realize that value when the time is right for them. But it does cause us a little concern when we think about will our own kids be able to afford to move in or to stay here? Will our older adults be able to stay here? If they're trying to downsize, where can they go? We don't have smaller, moderately priced condo necessarily for everyone who's gonna want one. So it is a concern. So the housing element tries to address this by talk of the master plan tries to address this by discussing ways we can try to create um, either through subsidized affordable units uh, that are smaller, but also through market rate units that could be available for 55 and older active adults. Uh, that's, that's a need in Arlington. Uh, I'm, I'm always surprised to hear how many people tell me, you know, where, where can I find a condo if I'm downsizing in Arlington? And, most of what's been built, uh, well, Sims and Brigham's, it's, it's at the luxury price range. So that's great, but it doesn't meet everyone's needs. So and we will not be, They're not condos. They're all apartments. Yeah. Right. That's true. There are only very few condos up at Sims, or the, the townhouses. Right. So if, it, if, you got, if you're trying to sell your house and you want to make sure that you, you, know, you don't get a huge capital gains, you got to roll it into another building, right. and there's no condos for sale. They're all apartments that are going up. So it's frustrating. Yeah. Okay, can, can yeah, yeah, what, what I think, that sort of begs the question, what do you attribute the big attraction is to people wanting to move to Arlington? If you're willing to pay 50, 100,000 over an asking price for a home in Arlington, what is the main attraction to these people? Well, there are many. One of them is you don't have to drive as far. To get, if you're working in Boston or Cambridge, you don't have to drive as far. You don't have to go all the way out to 128. You've got access to Alewife. You've got access to the Minuteman bike path, which is uh, the most popular rail trail in the country. You have good schools. You've got, uh, you know, we, a lot of people complain that we're so dense. Well, it's a real asset, because you can walk anywhere. You can go, you know, a lot of people in Arlington, not everyone, but a lot of people can walk a short distance from their home they can do a lot of errands. They can get to the library. They can get to the dry cleaner. They can get to, to the to the coffee shop. They can get their hair done. You know, <coughs> it's, it's a terrific. And that, uh, excuse, excuse the phrase walkability because it's kind of planner slang, but I think you all know what I mean. Yeah. That's become so popular. Uh, urban designers who are working in areas that aren't yet developed are building, and they want Arlington's fabric, they want our density, they want our proximity to services and, and amenities. Uh, it's, I don't know who to credit, but it's, uh, we are just very popular. Our model, the model of uh, this type of urban design is, is very much in demand now. And Carol, Thank I think you. we're also strategically placed in a very hot regional housing market yeah. in a very strong regional job market, especially in the higher technology areas of uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, healthcare. biotechnology, healthcare, uh, military uh, defense spending, um, high computer technology, research, research and development, and uh, we have highway access on Route 2, as you said, we have urban access. We are ideally located for somebody who wants to work in Cambridge or who has to have an office in Cambridge, but also needs to go out to 128 uh, to companies out there. So uh, because we're so strategically located, people want to live here, and a lot of well-paid people uh, <coughs> want to live here, and they're bidding up the price for property. We're also close to an international airport. Um, in fact, that's one of the drivers of the Boston economy in general. Many of you probably get on planes that fly overseas. And really, it's it's, there are hubs around the world, and Boston is becoming one of those international hubs. It's very attractive. So, I mean, I don't know how long it is, maybe a half hour cab ride to, to Logan. 
Okay, Tom. Being a developer in Arlington, years ago I developed 27 condos on Mass Avenue. There was an old Texaco gas station. Developers today don't want to come into Arlington. I don't want to come into Arlington. Yeah, it, it's to it's hard. This. It takes a long, long time, a lot of money to get through the process. It's mm -hmm. not easy. It's it, you need to educate the, the the people, not so much the people giving out the permits. It's the people that are coming in town. They don't want it. We can sit there and we can do this and this is great and your efforts are great and I agree with everything you're doing. We need to do this. The people coming in town do not want this. This when is really you, common. When you, you, yeah. you, you have somebody that wants to put a pimple on their house that's not by right, it, it's, it's a nine month process and they're, not, they're only gonna get a third of what they want. Yeah. It, it, it's the You're education about of the, the butters, place. correct? Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about the vote. I'm talking about anything in this town. It is very, very difficult because of the people coming in town. They, they're not looking for that. I don't know how you're going to educate or convince them, but they seem to be satisfied paying the taxes you're paying and not having it increase. Yeah, Developers a, do. They talk about it. They do not. I haven't developed anything in Arlington in 10 years, and I... And I won't because I know what's going to happen. I know the cost before I even dig a hole. If you didn't have a special permit process, if it were by right, do you think that would be a big oh, difference? Oh, that would be absolutely. I mean, I think you have to have something in place. I don't think you just play cowboy. But I think what you're going through now is incredible. Mm. It's really incredible to put something through that process. Yeah. It's scary, so it's people just, just back away from it. But I think you need to educate the people. I think the people is your problem. Yeah. It's interesting how so many people will move to a, a desirable community and then they don't want it to change. They're a newcomer, but they don't want anything they don't to want change. It. Okay. Nobody likes change. <coughs> Go ahead. I have a question, sir. So you might have projected like 20 years from now, how, uh, what is the population is going to be increased from now on, right? And based on that projections, uh, have you projected how many new housing units do we need? Like say for like a tour. I don't years. have the um, chapter and verse at the tip of my fingers, but to mix metaphors. But in the master plan, we do have demo a demographic section at the front, and we have a housing section that does project our housing needs and talks about um, <coughs> how many, uh, what percentage of our population is um, housing burdened. That means they have to spend more than thirty percent of their income on rent. So there's a lot of good information in the housing section, and yes, we do have projections. Carol, I can answer some of his questions. Thank you, go ahead. Uh, the state projects that we'll uh, grow our population by about 9% by 2030. Um, and so we're at about uh, 48,000 right now. That'll boost us up about another 4,000 people um, by uh, 2030. So that's kind of a baseline. Okay, why um, so a finance question, the finance committee. So I see on the implementation plan consultants for a lot of items. But oh, I, don't you see any, that. I don't see any money in the budget for consultants. So what's your plan for that? Everything that's in the implementation <coughs> table, if it entails any spending, would have to go through the budgetary process that everything else has to go through. And that's one reason why we want to bring this resolution to town meeting. So town meeting takes notice of this implementation table. And frankly, I think there's too much in there that has consultants listed in that column. I think there's a lot of that that staff should be able to do or without handing over a huge contract to a consultant. But you're but not planning on a consultant in 2016? We will probably <coughs> need a consultant to overhaul our zoning. But you haven't requested the funds. You haven't requested funds for that. We have some funds already set aside, and we'll probably also ask for some additional community development block grant funds. Okay, thanks. John? John? Yeah, you just touched on my question, which is, um, can you give me a better sense of the implementation time frame? You know, when you say near term, mid term, long term, the summary, what are you talking about there? We, wa we wanted more of a schedule for implementation, and we were advised against doing that because it, it for a vi variety of reasons. So we settled with the near term, mid term. The first thing we're doing is the design guidelines. Um, we we will be forming an implementation committee, probably right <coughs> after town meeting, 
to sort through that implementation table and to decide what are the what are the in each element you want to give a little <coughs> equal time to each element of the master plan. What what are we going to put into play first? We are also uh, one of the very next steps is to try to get uh, an update to our housing plan going. Uh, we do have a housing plan, but it's, it was done, I believe, I'm going to say 10 years ago. So it's really time for us to update that housing plan. We, are, um, we have a draft grant application in right now to, uh, to, to get that done. So the implementation committee will do a lot of work to try to prioritize that implementation table. And, and when are you targeting to get the housing plan completed? We would like to have it completed within a year because we want to take advantage of, um, the, you are familiar with the Community Preservation Act, I'm sure, and uh, there will be an opportunity or an obligation to create a community preservation plan uh, in the first year of uh, for CPA. And so we want to have that housing plan ready for uh, uh, trying get the funding through the CPA if possible to fund some of what we, uh, some of the recommendations in the housing plan. Alan? Uh, no, I, I think it's a very exciting plan. It's a great vision. Uh, it certainly convinced me to spend the next 50, 60 years of my life here. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's interesting to hear, Danny asked, you know, why do people want to, why do people love the town so much and want to move here and stay here? And Tommy pointed out how difficult it is to change things. I'm not sure those are unrelated. I mean, might not have exactly the right balance, but as you said, I think we've preserved a lot of the qualities that other towns are trying to get back to in terms of livability. But back to the financials, um, I, I'm wondering about the uh, impact on the tax base of mixed use. And you may not be able to answer this. It may be a question for the assessors, but just for example, if the Brigham's property, if there was a way to have developed that as a mixed-use property, say a restaurant, an ice cream shop on the first floor and a couple floors of professional offices and then residential above that, how would that have impacted, uh, same square footage, would that be a higher or lower tax base than it is now? Can, no, can, can, through, will mixed use allow the same square footage to be taxed at a higher, assessed at a That's higher That's an value? excellent question and I, I, I don't know the answer. I met with the assessor this week because I, I myself want to learn more about um, assessing different classes in Arlington in particular. But, you know, the way they look at it is if you get um, a large commercial destination, you're bringing in outside dollars, and that really rocks your tax base. Uh, mixed use isn't really a destination, isn't always a destination use, unless it's on a scale of, um, is it Assembly Square is some of the ones thinking of? Um, that's a lot of new retail. It's much more retail than it is residential. Uh, maybe their next phase will be more residential. But I don't think the Brigham's property could have handled that much retail. So I'd be, I would only be speculating. My opinion is that having more shops there or offices, a, a more variety of uses would bring more people to that location. And I think that kind of activity would increase the value of the property at resale and would therefore increase the value. But that's something that we need to look into more as we go into implementation phase, looking at fairly recent mixed-use developments and looking at their assessment and trying to understand that, trying to provide an answer for ourselves on. We know that pure commercial and pure business it, it br brings a better return, but mixed-use seems to be what <coughs> we're going to be able to see sooner here, so that's what we're going to look, look for. Alan, I've looked at a number of studies, many from the West Coast and some on the East Coast, and they uh, the mixed use properties on a fiscal basis provide a better return than those pure residential mm -hmm. ideas, mainly because you're substituting <coughs> some of the residential space for commercial space that, as mm -hmm. Carol alluded to, they have lower costs to the town and they bring in uh, similar taxes. So, on, on just that uh, research basis, uh, they're seeing um, better returns from 
mixed use building than from just purely residential. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, the devil's in the details, it really depends yeah. on the mix of use space. Itself. I'm still going to go back to addressing increasing the assessed values sure. to relieve financial burdens. This is the finance committee. Okay. I have one. Okay, Peter. Um, concerning near term, mid term, and long term, what is the uh, what, what do you think the plan is good for? Twenty years or fifty years? Or? I think parts of it are have a twenty year horizon. I think other parts of it have a fifty year horizon. It depends on what task and what element uh, we you know when we're talking about uh, new schools. I hope that's going to be more than a twenty year horizon. So long term is perhaps 20 years? I think the average should be 20 years, but some of the, some, some of the uh, recommendations in here would be take us out to 50 years. But that's mostly for, I, I think, large public facilities. Okay. Do you want to touch upon the, the, the revisiting the plan? Oh, thank you. Uh, it's common practice for a master plan to be updated every five years. Uh, I think we're going to have <laughs> hands full for the first two years, so don't hold me to five years, but it is um, expected that you look at a, plan, at a master plan at regular intervals to update it. It's not something, again, that's etched in stone and you never deviate from it. <coughs> it's not how the world works and that's not how master plans are expected to be. I, got, I have one concern here. I think a lot of the stuff you've done is great and, and moving in the right direction. The mixed use, I mean, Ken, you're saying, we, we had a house on working class blue collar Teal Street in East Arlington, two blocks away from Somerville, uh, that went for over a million dollars to everybody's shock. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I think, you know, the one bedroom, maybe two bedroom apartments on top of commercial areas uh, is gonna be able to provide some of the more uh, affordable housing and, uh, but you've already explained to me why they can't do that because of the parking. So there's an issue you know about like now. And I went back into the warrants and oh, where's the warrant article that corrects that? And it's not, there's no warrant articles in here. And I'm afraid that with the consultants and looking over the zoning, it's going to be seven years before we see the changes to the zoning that will allow for regular mixed use on Mass Ave and probably Broadway and maybe a few other streets. So when are we going to see that fixed with next year's housing, which you already know about? Next year? One of the things we heard in the input was, uh, that, that struck me, was con such contradictory public comment on parking. And that is one of the obstacles to mixed use. Uh, some people think we don't need parking requirements. People will use the bus, particularly if it's a small unit. Uh, people will use the bus. Other people feel that we need to keep parking requirements up so that, for whatever reason, you can fill in the blank. Uh, there was a developer in Austin, you might know about this, Tony, a developer in Austin who looked at his neighborhood and his potential clients and said, we're not gonna need parking for this building. None of my tenants, none of my owners are going to want a car. And the abutters said, no way. You're going to be having all kinds of cars in the street, so it is an issue, but that's one of the recommendations. Well, they can't have cars in the street now, and after this winter, that issue should probably never come up again. So, you know, you, you, uh, you have a, a reason why mixed use can't happen. Why can't we see that? Put it before town meeting, she tried. correct? That, it. Yeah, tried yeah, that ago. could potentially go to town to meeting ago. very soon. Okay, no choice. Uh, the, you know, there are different approaches to changing our zoning. Sometimes the consultants will recommend, first, recodify and clean up the internal contradictions in your, I think that's great, but I don't feel like we have the time to do that. Yeah. I feel we've gone through this master plan process, which was worthwhile. Planning is always supposed to precede zoning. Massachusetts is one of the only um, states where it's not compulsory to plan first before you do your zoning. So we finally have a, a, a comprehensive master plan, and we're, we really need to uh, get just really get going on the zoning change. Time, time's wasting, you know? Yeah. I've been anxious. I'll say so, but 
you know, I, I just urge you to move ahead with the things you know about as quickly as possible. Thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> That'd be a two-thirds vote, though. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, so my, my only two cents, having listened to this, and it's sort of more of what Tom and Charlie are saying, is um, I, I would suggest that your next step is really to dig in on the um, real estate owners or developers side and understand what they actually want and are willing to do. Because um, while well, I hear you talk passionately and with energy about mixed use, I, I, I don't really see it as something that's viable. And here's why. Let me give you, a, I wrote down three quick examples, right? So let's see if we can clean up the zoning bylaws. The first one is the rare vacant land or vacant spots along Mass Avenue. Take where the CVS is, for example, right? So you have a vacant land, it's a pad site. CVS comes in, they've got their 20 or so prototypes. They pick the one that they can fit in there. They go before the redevelopment board. Boom, they're done, right? They don't want to be second floor, third floor, landlords, things like that. So that's a challenge. Um, now I'll take the majority of Mass Ave, which are already existing structures. So I think about over where I live off of um, Mass Ave and, and Park, where I see, I know there's a building here, photo here. Some it's two, three floors, and the whole section of it's one floor, right? So you have a you have a property owner, they own the building, they're collecting rent, they have, as long as I've lived there, they've had full occupancy, so they're collecting their rent each month. Now, I don't know if that building could support a second or third floor. If it can't, you're never <coughs> going to convince them to forego rent for two years to knock it down and go through a whole development effort just because we want to do it, right? There has to be incentive for them to redevelop the property, or, um, or if it could bear the load, that they'd have to do the capital investment to then have a return, right? So I, I, I would sort of, my own feedback is, you know, there, there, there's that, that's the next big gap if we can sort of convince ourselves as a governmental entity that this is a good thing to do, um, but to convince the people that have to invest the capital that it's a good thing to do, even if we change the zoning, might not be the easiest task. That's quite possible. Um, I do have a couple property owners who have been knocking on my door over the past couple of years saying, when am I gonna be able to add a couple condos above my restaurant? And I'm glad to hear that because there are some, I'm glad to have a few uh, property owners who are interested in trying to do that. Whether they would get financing for it, whether they could find a developer who would be equally comfortable doing the fit out for the business as use as they would for the residential, they're, they're not, typical, they're not as abundant as a developer who strictly does residential or, or who only does uh, office or who only does retail. But they are out there and w if we have one building, one mixed use building go up, other property owners take notice and, and it starts to happen. I can't tell you which lenders are going to be more amenable to taking on that risk, but some mixed, new mixed use infill buildings in village centers in Metro Boston have, have been built in the last seven years. So it can <coughs> happen, it has been happening. Uh, you are, your point is very well taken. There are lots of players. It's the property owner, it's the developer, you have to get a tenant for the retail space, and, and the uh, lending has to be in place. Right, and, and I'm just, you know, I'm not saying it, it, it can't happen, but I think one of the, um, and I'm sure, you know, we all have our private lives that don't involve the town of Arlington or governmental entity, and I, I, I always sometimes chuckle in when I volunteer for the finance committee and then I go back to my private sector life is um, the private sector commercial view of the government does not equate to the government's view of itself. Mm -hmm. They are... They are wildly different, um, and they're not very positive on the private side, sector side at times. With for a lot of the reasons Tom brings up, and I feel like that's the gap right there. Is you know, so people they don't people want to build their development, make their money, keep going. So that okay. makes sense. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Okay, I'd like to thank you all for coming. We thank really you appreciate you very it. Much thank for you. Very Okay, what I'd like to do is uh, get through as much as we can today. Um,
Now, the first thing is, uh, let's do the water bodies. Um, I handed that my proposed redraft and hope it meets pe uh, people's concerns. Now, what I, um, I basically added under the vote, the town manager shall report to the next annual town meeting on the status of the various war bodies of the town, including ponds and brooks. So I just wanted to, you know, brooks are an issue as well as ponds. Uh, and the short and long-term policies and programs. So, you know, we should have some policies as well as specific programs that we've been issuing that will be needed to maintain their quality. And then I added a comment under uh, uh, finance committee believes the long-term plan is needed to guide these efforts to maintain our river streams and ponds. So, that's my shot at sort of trying to uh, put together what people were concerned about last time. Uh, Paul. Um, I would suggest adding one word to that last sentence. Okay, under the vote? The, no, of the comment. Oh, the comment, okay. The last okay. sentence of the comment. And, and it's, a plan is needed to guide these efforts to maintain all our rivers, streams, Okay, I'll take that as a friendly administrative change. <laughs> and away, Paul. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the two ones, Al Life and the Mystic Rivers and Lakes, are, are primarily, uh, I think it's DCR, uh, conservation recreation. Uh, but we still want to know about them and, and what's happening. Uh, what do you think? Uh, Christine? Uh, I, um, I, I have a problem in the comment of, with the phrase, the current need is for treatment to reduce growth. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry, can you speak just a little bit louder? The, um, I, I'm, I have some disagreement with, you, with saying that the current need is for treatment to reduce growth of invasive weeds because uh, although that's what the money is being used for, we really don't know what the most current need is because we haven't studied it. Um, I would be more comfortable if we phrase it, um, the uh, money is currently being used for those, uh, for those reasons. Yeah, current use. Okay, um, what, what, what line are you sort of looking at? The uh, third sentence that starts, the current need is for treatment in the comment. Oh, in the comment, okay. I, I would suggest uh, the current use of the funds is for treatment because, uh, as I said, we don't know what the really what our needs are because we don't have we haven't studied that. Um, and I do have a question about. Well, we could say the current use. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Will the town manager have money to do this type of uh, analysis? Well, I, I originally was going to put in more than 40000 but unfortunately, uh, despite all the advice I give people, they put the dollar amount in the Warren article. Uh, and I, I've always taken, and most of the moderators have taken the position that, you know, once you set the dollar amount in the Warren article, that, that sets the high point. I think if the manager, I haven't run this by the manager yet, um, if the manager comes back to us in, say, September or something and says, you know, I'm really or hopefully come back sooner than that. I'm going to need some more money to help with this. Uh, you know, we could transfer it out of the reserve fund. I, I, I think uh, that's it. Also, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of manpower showed up here, uh, there, and I, and I think you could probably put some, uh, and we've got a lot of expertise in the town, so we could probably utilize some of that too. But I think if they need more money than is in here, my thought would be up to the committee, of course. You could use the reserve fund for transfers. And then, of course, you've got, you've got a very large public works budget that they could always probably find a few bucks. So I guess those are the two sources I'd see if they need more money. And we're not saying it has to be a, I, at least I don't think we're saying this has to be a 100-page report. Uh, I, I think, you know, it could be a, you know, going through each of the things and what are some of the problems and some of the things that need to be done. I, I think it requires 
correct me if you think I'm wrong, I think it requires simply more thought and pulling expertise from various people than it does to hire a consultant to, to do it. But. I would think it requires some expertise. Yeah. And, I, it, and it may require some money. In, in fact, I think I heard the chair of the Conservation Commission mention the, perhaps the need to spend money to do some analysis. Yeah. Um, my feeling is that if that costs money, it should come out of the water bodies fund, but. Well, it is, all the water bodies funds are being, are under the jurisdiction of the town manager. So I would think it would be upon the town manager to examine the resources that are available to him, both in this fund, public works, uh, and any other source he can get his hands on. And if he can't, then he comes back to the town, to the finance committee and says, I'll need an extra five, 10, 20,000 to, to finish this off. But if we're asking them to do a long-term plan, you know, we've got to re be prepared that that could be a request. Okay. Go ahead. So they increase the amount of, in, in their plan for water quality testing, Pan ID, and survey from uh, 5,000 to 15,000. And I thought they had talked about right. that money going towards yeah. a survey of the water bodies. Right. So I think there's, there's money in their plan we're just making sure they spend that money and deliver a report. Right. Scott? Yeah, I moved the Article 34 be voted. <coughs> the, the way you wrote it on the sheet with the two modifications that were recommended, changing the word need to use and inserting all between maintain and uh, our river. <coughs> I'll second that. Okay. <coughs> Is there any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay, uh, Gloria, you got those changes for the report? Okay, let's, uh, budgets. Carolyn. Okay, let's start with housing, and then. I'm sorry, with? with I'm sorry, human resources. One of those H words. <laughs> I didn't have enough supper tonight, maybe. Uh, it's 35 and actually really starts on 37. Human resources. So usually I um, start with salaries, which is on 38. Um, people's salaries are getting close to the top, if not just a little bit above the top, and a lot of that has to do with longevity. Um, there is one position where if you'll notice that her salary is actually above the base, and that's because a number of years ago when there was a study done. Um, th that particular job was decreased, but when that happens, we don't actually decrease a person's salary. We simply change the base to, as a uh, marker. So when that person leaves the job, the, the, the newer um, min and max will be put into effect. And that's true for a couple of other departments. There's one in legal, and there's one someplace else um, where that has occurred. Um, so, and the water and sewer offsets have to do with the work that Human Resources does that's related to water and sewer. <coughs> um, if you come back to the other page, the 37, you'll notice there's an increase in, the, the training is still very high compared to 2014, but it's flat. And that, um, originally we had talked last year that that was going to be for staff who wanted and needed um, in increased training in particularly um, IT skills for, um, if they were an administrator. In the end, what happened was we thought that a number of people were going to move from sergeant to lieutenant, and there's an assessment and some training that goes with that, and less people move, made that shift, and so that the funds were not used for that. We also thought we might use, lose a chief, 
and so we thought we would need funds for that shift. Um, what they are doing is they're developing, and we'll talk about this with IT as well, they're developing uh, IT liaisons within every department. And that will require some training and some of that will come <coughs> up here. And the purpose of the IT liaison in each department <coughs> is so that IT is not um, sought after for as much very low level uh, questions. And it allows them to do more higher level activities. In developing that, they decided they wanted to develop a comprehensive training program. So that program will start next year in 2016, not this year. Um, so there are some of those funds are still around. Hold on, let me switch to my I'm gonna research page. 15,000 of that was used for anti-harassment and anti-discrimination training for all custodians in schools and towns. Um, and I think some of the DPW staff. Um, and the other two 20,000s were the two programs I just described. Um, so there, this year that won't probably <coughs> be fully used, but there is an anticipation it will be fully used next year. Um, any other okay. questions? It's gonna be used for the IT liaison program? About 20K will be used for that. Okay, I assume you're recommending the 300-855? Yes, I'm, I'm recommending it as is, which is 300-855. Okay, are there, are, are there any questions? Now, you mentioned one thing on page 38, which is that um, one of the positions was being, how should I say it? Downgraded? It had been a number of years ago. Okay, so, so as soon as that person, this person here leaves, yes. that will be shifting down. Back, back well, no, the, so if you look, <coughs> the min is 54, the max is 69, um, and her base is 60, is, is there. Um, oh, you're right, so yes, that will be shifting down. And you, you mentioned the training, uh, one part was like ethics, discrimination. Yes, yeah, so it's um, sexual harassment. Anti-harassment, anti-discrimination training for all custodians in buildings. In FY16? That was, no, that was, that was done this past year. So that was 15,000 was spent out of this 50,000. Okay, questions? Okay, do, uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, motions for 30,855. Is there any further discussion on human resources? I mean 300,000. 300,000. 300, 300, 300, I was just trying to say something. Yeah. <laughs> 300,855. All those in favor, if we say aye. 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 Opposed? Favorable action? Okay. Unanimous, three, four. Now let's jump to reclassification because it's in the same sort of area. So you need to jump to the back, which is 235. And then I'm handing out, there's, I only have about 10 of these, so not everyone should take one, but this is the, the, the code to explain, oh, well, let me have one. Here. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, customer. Um, to okay. explain how this works. So 235 is actually the budget So does number. everybody have one or can look at one? No, we don't have them down here. Okay. And last week you got an updated reclassification. It looks like this. But this is, these ones have some codes next to them. And then in the very back of your booklet is the whole reclassification and job classification system. Okay, so why don't you go through it, you know, per section. So okay. section one, by reclassifying the following position. Yeah. So 
let me just t talk a little bit about re what reclassification is. Most reclassifications occur because a job or position requires the employee um, to have a greater independence in their thinking, problem solving, or planning, um, to have less direct supervision in a day-to-day -day basis on responsibilities, and to have more technical skill. It doesn't have to be all three, but it often is. Um, the other thing to note is that a lot of these re reclassifications, the person has actually been doing all of those things for at least a year. Um, what happens is the person or their manager notes the change. They have a conversation. If they agree that the job might need to be reclassified, then they go to human resources, and the human resources director makes a final decision and then presents it to us. So that's how reclassifications work. So um, how many people apply? Oh, I didn't get that number. So sometimes wanna, people want to know how yeah. How nice she was this year. Uh, how, many sure. applied, how many applied? How many were passed? How many were turned down? How many appealed? Passed and appealed. Okay. Um, that I'm not sure of. But if you look here, the in, under reclassification 1A, the master mechanic. Um, that reclassification happens by adding uh, 2A, the Master Mechanic Public Health, Public Safety Radio Coordinator, <coughs> and by eliminating 3A, which is uh, just uh, Master Mechanic Community Safety. And that, again, has to do with an <coughs> increase in responsibility. Um, the, the others, the um, Registrar 1B, 1C, 1D, and 1F um, are simply a grade change. So you'll see OA3 to OA4, OA5 to ATP, and ATP is um, a more technical lever as opposed to just an administrator. Um, in some cases, the others are just a shift of ATP level. Um, if we go, if if we go back to the office manager at one E, we are adding two B, and we're removing three C for that person. So the office manager is actually becoming a project manager, and the project manager is a title um, that more reflects what she currently does in her day-to-day -day work, um, and she's jumping up to an ATP-7 because of that. Okay, so that's E. And if you look at G, this is someone in the library, and we've changed that title from clerk to office manager. And again, it's reflecting the increase in her responsibilities, her, her or his responsibilities. Now, if we come down to the adding, we've already talked about the master mechanic. Uh, we talked about the project manager. The head of technology, this title used to be 3B which is technology librarian, and that implies one thing. The head of technology is actually a more accurate description of her job. Her level is not changing, it's simply the title that is changing. The public safety dispatcher is we're removing 3D, the technology communications dispatcher. It's simply, again, a change in title. There's no change in the um, job description, in the level. Now, the one that's interesting is the MEO3, the two MEO3s, 2F and 2G. Um, these two people have, uh, last year we reclassified them because they needed to obtain a license for their specific um, piece of equipment that they're using, the catch basin and the crane. Um, that 
may be wrong. It might have been everyone in that group needed to have some licensing. But these particular gentlemen, they needed additional training in order to operate these pieces of machinery. And no one other than them can operate that machinery. And therefore, she felt that they should be able to, although they're staying MEO3s, they're jumping from MC6s, 5s to MC6s. Um, so there's no, there's, they're not, that job didn't exist before, so we're not deleting a job. We're not really adding a job. We're just acknowledging the fact that they have this particular skill, and so therefore they should have um, a little higher grade for it. And the records attendant to H, um, that's actually a downgrade because the person used to have exposure to prisoners er, and doesn't anymore. Um, and then but on the other side, we've talked about every, everyone. So these, these positions are all being deleted and it's either because an, of an addition or a reclassification or in some cases both. Okay, Ken? Ken. Just out of curiosity, on first paragraph H, the regional energy manager, it yes. appears he goes from ATP5 to ATP7, yet there's no money involved. <coughs> How's that? I'm not sure. I see zero dollars. Doesn't right. make sense. Right. That means, that means there's no money involved. Um, this was something that was added last year, and I think she also <coughs> said... I'm not sure of the reason for that. It just seemed odd. Mm -hmm. it, jumped, it jumped like two uh, right. pay grades, right. and you get nothing extra. Right. Well, maybe the salary was already negotiated, oh. and the reality is that it's at that level. Oh, here, wait, let's see. I knew I had this page somewhere. Uh, this person was shared by Bedford, the increased hours and responsibility in Arlington. Clearly, um, the person is doing this level of work. So there was no... Um, negotiation of salary change. Their hours were clearly increased um, so that they're being paid more by the town of Arlington, but the salary itself hasn't changed. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions? Okay, any other questions? And when this comes up, if there's any questions. Here, you're gonna come to me. I can yep. give you my piece of paper with all my little notes. No. <laughs> I'm going to start spreading this stuff around a bit, even though they probably want to hear from Karen. Peter? Uh, uh, Josh? Yeah? The, uh, is that the only one that's already in the budget? All the others are? We didn't, uh, when we make, had our interviews, we didn't know about the, uh, is that right? I'm, oh, that's a good question. They're Are in they the reclassification article. Right. Yeah. So that so yeah, they shouldn't money's show up until next year. Right. So the monies the monies are here. Is that we're yeah? We so actually <coughs> uh, we'll have to have Gloria actual language in here. Take a look at last last year. It looks like you've already sent this to Gloria. Yes. Okay. So Gloria, take a look at last year. We're actually at furthermore, X dollars is appropriated to be expended under something like that. So so it comes out of the reclass warrants. It does it because this is a warrant article, right? Right. right. So you'll yeah. see sometimes you're comparing, you know, last year's to this year's, and all of a sudden there's a big jump where it shouldn't have been because you know there's no pay, there's no colas there, mm -hmm. and that's because of this. So it's just something you always have to keep in mind when you're looking at your budgets. And and I did catch if you notice in some of your salaries that the that their salary is higher than the min and the max. We had a number of reclassifications last year. I think it was at least eight. I have it in here somewhere. And uh, two of the ones I was responsible for, the min and the max in the um, salary page hadn't been changed, had not been upgraded. So if you see that the person <coughs> is significantly higher than what the range looks like, it may be because they were reclassified and those two numbers weren't changed. Um, or, or it could be the two peop the other two people, one in legal and was, one was, was Excuse me, wasn't it that um, some of these positions, some of the some of the individuals mm -hmm. were reclassified into a lower position, 
but the town is not reducing their salaries. In other words, they're, they're staying at the same salary. Right, there's four people like that in town, but also the reclassifications, at least that I was responsible for last year, those numbers weren't changed on their salary page. Um, so if you see it and you're confused, just ask me, and I, I do have more detailed notes. They weren't included in the salary page in the budget report? <coughs> right, so what you'll see is you'll see their new increased salary, and you're like, wait, that new salary is much higher than the oh. base, the max base. Okay, you mean so we the, the salary's been appropriated correctly, right? But that budget book didn't have the min and max correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Peter, you addressed part of my question, but uh, seems to me there's a a long-standing finance committee management issue. Uh, <coughs> we don't. When we talk to the department heads, we don't know about these, these things. Unless they happen to tell us, right. we can't ask. Right. Yeah, you could. You so could. We're, we're com completely dependent on you, your critique of the, of the uh, change in classification. Yes, yeah, so, and if you have questions, I do have notes on almost every single one to what the rationale was. Well, this year it should pop out because there's no COLAs involved, so the salary should be flat. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, if it pops up, Did you could look at last year's FinCom report. You mean in FY16? In 16. No, these don't, that's my point. These don't this show in, they in don't the show budget. On, yeah. No, that's correct. Right, that's they will show next year. Yes. Yeah. But if, if, if you see it in this year, mm -hmm. a jump up, you'd have to check last year's Finance Committee report under this article to see if that's the reason for it. Right. But that, that does bring up the point, when you talk about the salary page with your department heads, one of the questions you may want to ask is, are there any re reclassifications that I don't see here? Um, I guess that's that the answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there any other questions from the committee? Okay. I, I'm. I'm still a little confused on the regional energy manager. Okay. You mentioned that they actually increased his pay because of hours. Well, they, they didn't increase his, he's, he's making more money from the town because he's working more hours, but they didn't increase his pay. Okay, so that there should be a dollar figure in here then. Oh. There's an overlap for it. Between 1825 and 1857, I just checked. There's a big range where, they, where there's overlap. Oh. Okay. okay. Oh, so that's okay. So he was already he was at the high end of ATP five, which is in the lower lower end of ATP seven. Oh, ATP seven. Okay. So therefore, but I, but I did just check, and his salary is going up, but he's moving departments. So maybe that's why they didn't put it in the reclassification. Okay. Oh, it should be in uh, it's a public works, right? Right. She, it's a she. She. It's a she, and she's moved into a different division. Within Public Works? Within Public Works, and she has been given an, uh, an, an extra day. She's working an extra day, an additional day okay. here. But her pay is being, that difference is being made up with an offset. That okay. Makes, makes any difference. Which is why we're not seeing it in the reclass. Maybe. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, for basically this vote as presented with the additional language <coughs> Gloria will submit that actually says the language about the appropriation of the total. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Favorable action, unanimous. Okay, next is. Uh, okay, uh, three, four, and four. You'll have to add it up and figure out what it is. Next one is information te technology, which is uh, page 41. Did you hand out another page on that? Yes, there was a new there was a new version of that page that you received last week. 
And so it doesn't have a, oh, it does have the number on it. Your new, your new salary page is very difficult to read, but you can look at the old one because there's no changes. As a matter of fact, there's no change to the bottom line on any of these because this is one of the examples where we had two people reclassified and I simply had him change the min and the max under the base, but the salary didn't change at all. Okay, so the only so change is that min max. The, yeah, the only change is the min max on two of the positions. Okay. One of them is it's 54.3 for two people now. You don't have that as two people on your original. And the other one, I think, it's in the 60s. I'm not sure if it's Mixis or Karowski. I think it's Karowski. That was from last year. So is that the only change in the substitute page? Yes. Looks like Those are the only two changes in the substitute page. Um, many of the staff are at or near max. It's either because of the length of time they've worked here. Two people have worked here for 25, no, one person for 25 years and one for 30 years. The other thing is in the last four years, I think it is, we've hired some people with advanced degrees and a lot of experience, and so that's why they are near the max. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to retain them because they're liked in the department. and by the people they serve. Um, Charles Norton manages and maintains the ICS system, which is used for collections by the treasurer. He'll be key to the conversion from ICS to MUNIS. That'll take place in 2016 and 2017. Um, Sue Disler manages the larger systems and offers desk support. She and others may get some relief with the IT liaison program that's being developed. So those are the big <coughs> things on salaries, unless you have questions. And then on the other page, the water, the water and sewer offsets are um, primarily uh, similar to a chargeback for services, including development of a quarterly billing and automatic meter reads for the water and sewer department, which we all are benefiting from nowadays, I think. Um, computer maintenance, 15,000 of that was spent on some of the network equipment was upgraded this year and it's back under warranty. Oh, that's why that number went down $10,000. Um, it will most likely increase again next year uh, as some other things come off of wa warranty. It remains twice as high as it was in 2014 because he's now using oh, some operating dollars to pay for um, I just see that strategic plan projects. Um, and he's using contractor consultants for repairs and for the GIS mapping maintenance. One of the things, I don't know if any of you noticed yet, there's a new line item that's $23,000 just above that. Um, and that is to help pay for the strategic plan um, that he implementing the strategic plan because up until now there hasn't been light items for the strategic plan. And I have a detailed um, grid master, of the master plan? No, the strategic plan for IT, the oh, IT strategic okay. plan. So you have a description of that to I have a very lengthy one. Hold on. Hold on. So for those of you who can see it, this is, this is what it looks like. And if you notice, it's fairly heavy. In through here, and this is the this will be next year. And if you also notice there's some light colors, that means those projects which in theory will be done in four months, some of them clearly won't be. Um, so at the moment there are 12 projects in the works, and their completion is 5%, a couple 75 to 100, most of them around 50 to 
and complete for this could, year. Could you give a just a brief description of some of the things they're doing? Sure. Um, for 2015 or for 2016? 2016. 2016. Okay, so <coughs> IT department, they're going to integrate the help desk and use a ticketing tool for all departments. They're re improving or replacing of ICS, payroll, the employee self-service system, health and human services, explore WimWam software for food inspections, info technology, they're looking at plain metrics from Mass Ortho, imagery GIS, the police department, they're looking at software currently under consideration is DataVis for Smart 911, DPW, they're looking at s payroll system improvements, human resources, improving integration of benefit tracker and GIC billing, DPW, remote access to documents such as scan plans, MS office documents, as well as work or management tools, library payroll, recreation and town manager planning, they're developing and implement room reservation tool and now it goes on. Is this money for materials, overtime, software? No, this is so this is to implement. So for the most part it I think it has I think materials are coming out of are they coming out of capital plan? In Charlie? some cases they're licenses too. Okay. In some cases they're licenses. Um, some cases if it's materials it's coming out of the other um, line items. And in some cases, it may be coming out of capital plan. I think it's more consulting than it is an in that sense. Okay. When you have a chance, could I uh, could I just get a copy of this? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's that line item. Any other questions? I can. I have more Alan? information. Um, you mentioned that uh, Charles Norton will be implementing a change from the tax collection system from ICS to Munis. Mm -hmm. um, we did a reserve fund transfer for twenty thousand dollars to the treasurer. I thought it was to investigate or do RFPs. Right. Right. So they haven't stu they haven't chosen what they're going to do yet or how they're going to do that process. But that process is in the budget in IT, and we're assuming in treasurer as well. We haven't met with the treasurer department yet for twenty sixteen and for 2017. <coughs> so they're doing the RFPs now, it's 2015, that may or may not start before the year is out. That's only four more months. Um, hopefully they'll start that in 2016 and be finished by the end of 2017. Okay. Now it, is, it sounds like Munis isn't certain that that's just a, a placeholder for a right. new system. Right, right, for a new system, yeah. In other words, right. it sounded like the decision had already been made. No, 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 oh, sorry, it sorry. It's just yeah, no, it ICS hasn't. to something new. Just something new, sorry. And part of this, remember, I'm not an IT person. Got it. So, you know, I pick up about 75% of what he says. <laughs> yes, I just want to mention that the uh, Charles Norton work there is largely to coordinate the, uh, whenever this new system comes in, they're going to have to run in parallel for right. four or five months. So, so it's whatever the system is, not necessarily. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. Are there any other questions for on IT? Okay, what are your recommendations? My recommendation is the budget as is, as it stands. 695-137, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? On three, four. Okay, next one is retirement budget. Uh, oh, no, no, yeah. sorry, the next one is comptroller, it's the next page. Um, on the salary page, again, they're close to the max because most of the staff has been there a long time. <coughs> oh, but you may, may notice one interesting line item, which is a new one for Bono. Um, Bono, is that how you say it? Bono? Um, it's, a, it's a male pickup stipend. So we had an ongoing issue where the mail needed to get from town hall to the comptroller's office. And so the solution was to pay her $2 a day because it's on her way to work to pick up the mail. Um, <laughs> it was went through the union and it all is okay and the town manager approved it and so that's why it's there. Did she drop off the retirement board stuff too? <laughs> <laughs> <Not sure. laughs> Um, so, so that's the only thing that looks unusual there. Um, 
back on the comptroller page. Let's see. Everything else is the same. Everything else, for the most part, is the same. And why the telephone almost doubled between 2014 and 2015 is that um, they, the maintenance of the old system, the actual spend probably won't, will be closer to the 52 than the 92. However, there's an RFP for a new phone system. They are currently getting a count on all phones, which appear to be around 1,100, and 500K has been set aside in the capital plan for this project. Part of the 92K in 2016 will pay for a project manager during the transition from the old to the new system. And the other part will continue to pay for the maintenance on the current system. So when do they anticipate getting a new system? What did I just say? Year 2016. Thank you. And they'll also be transitioning the water sewer bills to whatever the new system is, replacing ICS eventually. Are we still saying with one and a half telephone operators <laughs> after the new system? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. That's a highly sensitive subject. Yes. <laughs> Name there. Oh, uh, Any other questions? Okay, questions for the controller's budget. Okay, you're recommending as printed? Yes, which is 422261. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Next? Uh, retirement. Pension. Now we jump to the other side. And that is 161. There is no salary line item here because the salaries come out of the pension um, reserves themselves, the pension fund itself. Uh, the town does pay six months of the salary and expenses, and then the pension fund is charged the exact amount of these expenses, and it's considered transfer of funds. So that's why there's no record of it here. Any questions? Okay. So not the trip has dropped $123. So we did have a death. There are four people left in the non-contrib. They're all in their 90s. Um, we almost had someone make it to 100. Um, and um, we will continue to fund that at whatever the cost is, which will be around the 87 um, for the next five or six years, I would say. Are there any questions on retirement? Okay, you're recommending as printed? Recommending as printed, which is 9140241. Okay, and the retirement costs have gone up to 5.51%, which I think so is the agreement. Yeah, so originally um, it had been set at 6%, but the retirement board and um, a number of us met and the town manager met in late fall, early winter, and requested that it be dropped to from 6% to 5.5% um, because we would still reach fully funded within the allotted amount of time, um, but it allowed us to avoid the deficit or decrease the amount of deficit, and the retirement board agreed to that. Dean? Are we, um, what is our full funding date? Our full funding, we have to be fully funded by 2040. It had been uh, 2032, it's now 2034. And one of the- 2034 because we kicked out- Because we, we, we went 5 down 5 to 5.5. 5. Okay. Um, what we did agree and what the wording states is if the market should drop again, and it doesn't look like we'll be fully funded by 2037, we have the option to revisit that number, that discount rate and potentially increase it again. 
and we all felt that we really should try to be fully funded by 2037 so we don't get stuck right at the end. Okay. Um, and so that's the current plan. Now the other thing that this affects, which we're going to talk about next, is the, is the OPEB, the other um, post-employment benefits. Because the plan is once this is fully funded, we will start actually funding that with more than just a drop in the bucket. And so we're pushing out when we start funding that. Um, so that just keep that in mind. That's another factor. Okay. Yeah. We finish one, we start with the we'll other. Start with the other. And we are <coughs> this fund is 49% um, funded. It had been 55% funded prior to 2008. I think if you went back to 2000, it was probably up to 75% or something. Uh, hasn't been a good decade for us. Okay, are there any other questions on retirement? Okay, the recommendation is 9,140,241. Do I have a motion? So moved. Seconded. Okay, moved move and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. 3 4. Now for OPEB, which, oh shoot, I changed the page. Um, oh, that's it's the a warrant, warrant article, so it's going to be further back. <coughs> well, that's really a warrant article. So I'm, I don't have my old one, but if you look back in the warrant articles, you should find it. 234. Okay, thank you. That's So the OPEP fund is 3.66% funded, so basically not very funded. Um, there's no, no state mandate to fund it, yet my understanding is it helps our bond rating, um, that we're doing something consistently. If we were to fully fund it over the course of 24 years, we'd be need, need to be putting in 6.4 million this year, 16.4 million this year. Um, <coughs> Sorry, could you repeat that again? So if we were to fully fund it over 24 years, like we're fully funding, we would need to be putting in 16.4 million this year. Now, there's questions about whether we should be fully funding it because we don't know what's happening primarily with health care over the long term. But fully funded and 3.6% funded are very different. Um, there was an agreement that was reached that each year um, there's a formula for how much um, that <coughs> the retirement board requests for this fund. It starts at 500000 and then there's a certain percentage that's added from the retiree HMO contribution. It's a share of their contribution. This year, that formula sets the share at 155. Um, however, we minus the 87K that we pay in the non-contrib out of this fund. So the minimum um, requirement would be 568. Now, the town manager over the course of the last couple of years has thrown in some extra money. This year, he's thrown in 92,000. Actually, it's 92 something. Um, and what he's done is he's, and that number may change a bit. The budget was supposed to be, you could increase it by 3.25%. At the moment, it's sitting around 2.95. And this 92,000 is that difference. Um, and so, and I asked him if he preferred that that stay there, using that money for this, and he said yes. Um, I understand that there's some <coughs> other thoughts about what we should do with that money, so. Now the OPEP is on page, uh, really on Article 38 in the Warren, mm -hmm. and like Carolyn said, I'm just going last year. Mm -hmm. There was an A, a B, and a C. A is the the difference between the base of 500,000 and the current appropriation for non-contrib that Carolyn just reviewed. So that would be 413,000. The second part is the HMO reduction, mm -hmm. and that's 155,000. Mm -hmm. And the third part is a transfer from the Health Benefit Trust Fund. Remember when we went into 
uh, GIC, we were paying premiums. We no longer had to have a health insurance trust fund. But rather than, and I think it was like $3 million, Charlie? Okay. So last year, I think the, uh, we transferred 300000 So rather than, you know, because if GIC sort of fell apart and we decided to go back and have a, uh, you know, and pay as you go, we need that health insurance trust fund. So we didn't want to just take the $3 million and throw it over. So his recommendation was to do 300000 a year mm -hmm. to give us some flexibility. Uh, so that would be 300000 So. So those would be the three elements that we're looking at for Article 38. Right. However, the 413, the 155, and the 300. Now the issue is, what do we do with the 92,800? Right. And the 300 does not actually show up here in the budget because it's coming from someplace else. It's not coming from the town manager's budget. Yeah, it's a transfer. Like it's a transfer. So although it shows up in the actual, that's because of a $300,000 transfer, okay, for 2014. If you look at 2014, it's 847. You're like, why is it that much? That's that transfer. So I think now we could deal with Article 38. I don't think the the 413, you know, the 500 mm -hmm. minus the non-contrib, <coughs> the 155 or the 300 is we've supported all along. So that would equal 868,000. Uh, the question is, what do we want to do with the 92,800? Uh, I think the manager made the recommendation because the, in, in his five-year plan, the, instead of going 7% increases in health insurance because of the GIC, that's come back down again. Now, we might have to revisit that because GIC is coming out with their premiums very soon. Um, or, uh, and therefore, the recommendation for that, the other option is to throw the money into war ice and snow uh, because you know we're chronically having deficits in that. Uh, do, do you know what we're up to spending now, Christine? One point seven. One point seven is the last number I heard. Yeah. Okay. So even with the seven seventy one plus the five hundred plus what we give in reserve fund, I mean we're underfunding snow and ice. So. I guess that's the issue to be thrown before the finance committee. You want to put the 92.8 in uh, uh, OPEP, which is a long-term liability, or do you want to put it in the snow and ice, which I guess is a short-term liability? So, Charlie? Could you just review for the committee um, what happens at the end of the year if we have a snow and ice episode? Right. Okay. There, there's, um, there's three ways to deal with it. One of them, obviously, is the budget. We've been increasing the budget for the last, I don't know, 10 years, with, often with bits and pieces, you know. So that's 771. Then the second thing that we've been doing right along is the manager in his five-year plan in, I think it's other, throws in a half a million dollars for snow and ice deficit. So that's built into the whole plan, so there's leeway for 500,000. And the third option is the reserve fund. So those would be the three ways that we do it. I think last year we used the budget, we used the 500, it basically throws it on the recap for the next year. And then I think we took like 250,000 out of the reserve fund. So those would be the three options to do it. If I can just re recast that. So if we don't spend the money, we don't right. appropriate money this year, it goes through gets added to the tax rate the next year. Right. And it gets, does it get added and reduce the non-exempt budget, or does it get added on top of the 2.5%? Uh, <coughs> no. It's not exempt from Prop 2.5. So, so, so it reduces our available Prop 2.5 budget in the following fiscal year. Well, it, it's really got to be planned for. So let's say, for example, uh, you know, we set us, he set aside 500000 and the budget is tight, and we appropriate everything, and all of a sudden, instead of 500000 it's 800000 Well, you know, you could usually jiggle the local receipts to cover that, but um, it's got to be accounted for somehow. <coughs> it's got to be accounted for within the limits of Proposition 2.5. It just doesn't get that's right. added as a that's, that's correct. So, you know, by, you know, say in another month, hopefully, or, or say in early April, you know, we sit down with the manager 
and decide, well, how much is left in the reserve fund? How much, you know, the budget's gone. You've got the 500. Can we cover the rest with the reserve fund? Or do we need to increase that deficit amount and decrease the amount we put in the long-term stabilization fund? I mean, that's, that's how we balance everything at the end of this, is with the, what goes into the long-term stabilization fund. Now, we can do that in the good years when we're putting money into it. On the other hand, when we get to the bad years and we're starting to take money out of it, you know, then we got to take more money out of it. So somehow it's going to be paid for. And of course, nobody can predict what we're going to have. In it. So, you know, the uh, the unfunded health insurance liability is calculated uh, several different ways. If we were if we were fully funding this at the um, sort of the GASB uh, appropriated rate which would be about $10 million, meaning we'd be putting in $10 million a year. The total actuarial liability is $124 million. The unfunded liability would be right now about $117 million. Because we're not funding it at the, um, the appropriate GASB rate, they, they calculate the liability using um, essentially the, what they figure is the town's cost of money. I don't know how to get to this, but in any event, it's it's about 4.4 percent. So the unfunded liability at that rate is somewhere around. Oh, let's see, it's uh, it's 185 million dollars. Okay. So that means over the to put it in different terms, it means over the expected life of the people in the retirement plan, employees in the retirement plan right now, the town is going to the town owes that plan 185 million dollars. Now. $92,000 isn't a lot of money, but if the town manager is willing to put it into that <coughs> account, um, personally, I, I would recommend that we put the $92,000 or whatever the amount was into the into the OPEB, and we we belly up to the bar and pay the snow and ice deficit, you know, out of near-term operating budgets. Okay. Otherwise. The other side I'll put forth is that we've got in fiscal 2020, you know, a, a nine or ten million dollar deficit, a uh, hundred thousand dollars that basically takes into account an expense over five years is, is four or five hundred thousand um, dollars. That that's sort of less to worry about that time override that type of thing. So if we got to comment on that. Okay, can I make it? I finish. So we got a, a, a short term, meaning five year liability somehow, and the OPEB is another liability, just a long term. So. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I take your um, viewpoint, we should take the $413,000 from the other fund that we're putting in and, and the, the other $355,000 and take all of that out and not pay anything into the OPEB at all. Doesn't matter how much you want to, how much you want to do. On the other hand, <laughs> we can start cutting the budgets and putting it all in yeah. OPEP. So, uh, you know, th this is not a. Yeah. What's the committee think? I'll put it out to them. Peter. Yeah. How about kicking it down the road until we uh, come to the end of the budget process? Maybe there'll be a lot of money left in the reserve fund. Well, it, it, it's, it, it really is, uh, it's not a short term, what's the money at the end of the line. We could have more local aid, which will help there. On the other hand, we're going to get the GIC figures, and, and those are probably worse off than, than we think. So, you know, it's, it's an issue. It's before us. It's a policy issue. Which policy do you want to do? I guess we could revote it. <laughs> you know, you always revote anything we've done, but it's before us now. You've heard the... Which way do you want to go? What? So just to clarify, this is for the snow budget for FY16. Yes. It would be rolled into the base snow budget going forward, so it does have impacts yeah. in later years. I so think we're basically readjusting the base of the snow budget up by 90000 For next which, year. For next year and, and going forward, presumably right. we would keep it there or, or continue to increase it depending on, well, on, on what things look like. So either, you know, and we're not going to increase the snow budget today. We're going to do, you know, Christine will get her marching orders depending upon how you vote today. So we either 
vote to put it in the OPEB, or when the DPW budget comes up, we'll put it in the snow and ice. But we did now, have, sorry, yeah. okay. we'll have a we did have a conversation with the town manager last year, and he had agreed to take a look at sort of the trends over 10 years, I thought. And I, I, I don't know how whether he still feels that 771 is really sufficient or not. I mean, obviously this year it's not even close. Last year it wasn't even close. So mm -hmm. the recent history is clearly, you know, even adding the half a million in both years, we were, we were way, over both, way over that in both years. So it would be interesting to hear from him whether he thinks 771 is a good number for the snow budget or if he's just keeping it there because he can't find any more money, in which case then your proposal makes a lot of sense. Alan? Yeah, for what it's worth, when we transferred $300,000 last year from the leftover trust fund, we, we sort of used a rationalization. It's health care money going to health care costs. Again, not, 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 a, not a real solid reason, but at least there's some rationalization that it's, it, it, was, it was tagged as health care. It was appropriated as health care money and should stay in health care costs. The, the, if we transfer the 92K this year, we're going to have to find 92K next year because that 92K is simply because. No, this would be next year's money. Right. I'm sorry, the year after that for 2017. We're going to have to find 92K for 2017 because the reason there is 92K is he's, he's looking at, he had thought the budget would come out, the year over year increase would be 3.25. He's managed to get it to 2.95. He may or may not be able to do that next year, and he may choose <coughs> to put that difference someplace else. Yeah, I think I think the math actually works the other way. Mm -hmm. If we if we put that money into OPEB this year, yeah. then next year there's going to be another ninety three thousand that, that that will have to go into OPEB again. Not have to, but presumably would go into OPEB again, okay. and on and on. I mean, it, because it's built into the base. The it's part of the base of this year's budget. No. But no, so the base is the 568, and then anything else last year. No, no, year no not, not, that, not that line item. Mm -hmm. The overall town manager's budget yeah. is, a, I don't know what the total sum is, I don't have it off the top of my hand, but it includes that 93,000. Okay, somewhere in the, within the budget. Okay, within right. his budget. Yes, within he's, his budget. He's putting it in a warrant article, yeah. which is a little bit confusing. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, uh, Tom? It seems like the snow and ice is increasing every year. It, it, it's become a, a real number now. And it seems to keep going up and up. And, and I don't mind spending the money, but I think we need to get a grip on what are we doing, how are we doing it, and are we doing it right for the value that we're getting? And that's no saying anybody, everybody's doing their job right. I just don't think we're, 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 we're looking into that like we look at other departments. <coughs> I mean, we are spending more and more money, and I think we're going to continue to spend more and more money. I think we, we just come in and manage the assets for 500 or 700 or whatever, and we say go. Uh, the plan is not there. The plan hasn't been there all winter. Um, Tim Funders and Dean asked what the plan was. That plan st <laughs> still really isn't there. And once again, I think they're doing the best they can. I don't know if we can if we can do it the way we think we can do it. So I I, I just don't want to do any money until we figure out what are we doing. Dean, so the ninety just to remember the ninety two thousand is coming from where? It's it's just general money. In other words, the manager got three point two five percent increase. Yeah, that's what he was allowed under the plan. He only increased his budgets. 2.95% and recommended that that balance of, you know, 0.3%, uh, uh, which was 92,800, yeah. go into the OPEP on the logic that um, a lot of this is because we brought down health insurance costs. So one to the other. My, so my comment would be, my, my frustration with that logic, I guess, goes back to my time when I first joined the finance committee. First joined the finance committee for like the first five years I was on it, the budget was 400,000 every year for snow and ice. And didn't matter if we increased two or 3%, for some reason we didn't 
it didn't need to include a um, snow and ice number. And one of the things I was told was that it wasn't really a $400,000 line item, it was a $900,000 line item because we kind of budgeted some money in next year's budget to to cover it. And, it, and for, I think we all knew for a long time that it, um, it, it didn't make any sense at that number, right? And Paul Wilson used to sit where Alan's sitting and he used to say that every year. And Brian's sitting next to me and he joined the finance committee and he said it every year, right? Um, and, and I think one of the things we all concluded as a committee is within the parameters of the town manager's budget, it is his responsibility to fund the snow and ice. Um, not to sort of, you know, not fund it and stay at 400000 for a decade and then hope that, you know, anything that tenant goes over, we raid the, um, we, we raid the reserve fund or we, you know, throw it up against um, next year's number. And, you know, it's been sort of, it just sort of goes to what Tom said, which is, um, you gotta have a plan. It's not just something that's, you know, I feel like sometimes the way we deal with snow and ice for a long time here is we've just sort of said it's it's not really, we, we kind of say it's not really a town manager responsibility because like you said, if it gets, the budget gets blown or it goes out of control or whatever, we don't care. Um, we just sort of let it go. And I think we gotta get, I think we've, I think we've come a long way getting past that by putting um, additional money and building it up. I did take a quick peek and the proposed number for next year would be 846, 846,000. So, so it's getting there, right? And I, but I don't think it's actually where it needs to be. It could be close. We take the 846 plus the 500,000 for the following year. Um, we're getting there, 1.346, right? Um, so then that leads to sort of the decision of this or OPEB. And I guess the real question is when you're at, you are now at 1.34 million, is that the right number? I mean, that's effectively where we are for a snow and ice budget. It's a long way from 900,000 combined. It's closer. I mean, do we want to push it up to 145 blended, or do we want to keep it at 1346? And that's sort of where I, and it's the thought process of the, of the accountability, but then it's like, at what point do we hit the number? I know 17 is excessive. I don't think we'll get to 17 again, but if you think normal is a, if you think a normal year really is about a million, then you know, Charlie's got a valid point if not funding it into the snow and ice budget. If you think normal is a million five, then it should go to the snow and ice. I guess the question is at this point, now that we've kind of moved in the right direction, what is normal? Uh, I, can ha I have some numbers for normal. Um, for our 10 year, uh, I'm uh, using 1.7 as this year's yeah. uh, number. The 10 year average. Um, for our snow and ice expenditure is 1.2 million. I'm sorry, 1.2. 1. 1. 1. Um, so the the 846 that's budgeted for this coming year is about 70 percent, 70 percent of the average number. Right, with the 500 though, and the, as the reserve for next year. Is so there a consequence over. for well, you know, the budget? Right, there is, and that's yeah. Yeah, I'm there's sorry. A consequ there's a consequence for over budgeting though. Which is well, which is so why you always want to come in under. Well, you, you, you always <coughs> want to appropriate at least what you appropriated the prior year. Yeah. If you don't do that, you can't overspend your budget. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we've we've been covering it with the five hundred thousand. It's basically a deficit spending from one year into the next, um, and we've been we've been trying to get away from that by having a realistic budget. But we don't want that number to go above what. Well, no, it, it, it just can't be over. It, if you appropriate eight hundred eight hundred sixty thousand, you know that becomes the base. You don't want to appropriate under that. Right, but if we but if we, if we appropriate eight hundred forty six and we spend seven hundred, right. and there's one forty six that it'll drop to free cash doesn't go but away. Free cash. But there's okay. one forty six that we could have spent somewhere, somewhere else, else under right. the long range plan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And the last. 10 years, we've only underspent, um, if, we, if we use that 846 number, we've only, we would only have underspent three times in the last 10 years. Three times? Three times. But it wasn't 846, but that was like 400 in the past, so we would have overspent it most Yeah, absolutely. Years. Absolutely. Because yeah. one of the things, what I'm trying to get at here is that what, we're in the unique position actually when we actually raised it, as you pointed out, we have three times, right? So. I never thought we'd be able to do this, but 
if we do get a, let's say, mild winter next year, we should be able to, and we go under budget, we should be able to then roll the 500,000 over to the snow and ice budget and get it up to, actually just move it ourselves up to one and three the following year. And then we'd actually have it all in one year. Well, it's under the manager's budget. So whatever, it, whatever we do within that budget would have to stay within, next year would be a 3% cap. No, what I'm saying is we have 846 in now, and then we also have, five, for, so fiscal 16, you have 846, and it's also gonna have 500,000 for fiscal 17. Right. So if fiscal 16 actually came in at, let's say 840, you could actually budget fiscal 17 at 1346, and you've now pulled the number to where you want the number of paying it in all in one year. So I think we're actually at that striking point for the snow and ice budget, where it, 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 it's where it needs to be. You keep moving it up for inflation two, three percent every year. I don't think it's all that far off at this point. Okay, so anybody else? Alan, did you want to? Well, going back to the 92,000, so it's not coming from the trust fund? From the no, no, trust fund? It's just no, no. We'll be doing all okay. three things the exact same way right. that we did it last year. The 413 from the non contrib the 155 from the uh, dropping the health insurance for uh, retirees from uh, our contributed yeah. from 90 percent to 85 and the 300,000 from the health insurance trust fund that would all stay the same so we're, we are doing 300,000 from the health insurance trust fund yeah. this year okay the question is do you want to put the 92,800 right. into the OPEB fund the long-term liability or do you want to put it into the snow and ice the short-term liability that's the only question so we're just Right. And then we'll vote the whole OPEP fund, and that will be done. So, so you any further discussion? Yeah, I actually have a Dean? separate question. So, um, the governor has a proposal for um, an early retirement mm -hmm. incentive. So, I know on the pension side, we have these um, occasional issues where a person might have worked for the town of Arlington for a certain amount Here's of time, time, and they go and they work for another new town, let's say the state. In this example, there's a shared billing right. at the end. Um, so forget, I mean, I kind of moved past the pension marks. I assume we're going to get, regardless, we'll just get stuck with that, right. our portion. Mm -hmm. on, the, um, on, the, on the health insurance side, and that's why I'm bringing up while we're going over this, but for the population of employees that retire before age 65 that have this cross thing going on mm -hmm. um are we going to get hit with those we if may. this goes through i'll have to ask rich but i bet we may well are you talking the early retirement yeah because that's just for state workers my understanding i haven't seen the actual language it's just, but, but i think it's just for state workers right but, so if you spent right, your first 10 years with the town of arlington right and your last 20 with the state are you eligible we, and if you are are we going to get we would a get chunk of that, that. i would. don't know i think we would good question I don't know if they'd know either because you know, might not know who's now working for the state. Well, okay, we'll so we've the got total, but the issue of the let's do the 928. Whatever you do there, we'll vote the rest of the OPEB fund, and, and that'll be it. So, do I have a motion? So move. Uh, what's your motion? What's your motion? What, what, what is the motion? Which way? Motion? Motion. OPEB or snow? Uh, OPEB or snow? <laughs> oh, OPEB. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Second. So the 92 is for moved and seconded for OPEB. OPEB. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of utilizing the 92,800 for OPEB, please raise your hand. going to have to abstain. Okay. And uh, how many for snow and ice? Okay. One, two. Okay. Now, Article 38 um, will include $413,000 uh, for Part A, $155,000 for Part B, $300,000 for Part C, and $92,800 for a new part D. Uh, do I have a motion on that? So moved. Second. Second. 
Okay. Uh, everybody understand what we're doing for Article 38? Yep. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I'll have to abstain again. Okay. Seventeen, zero, and one. Okay, Article Thirty-Eight, uh, and Gloria on Article Thirty-Eight, just add a D and say and further uh, appropriates into this fund uh, to be raised by general tax, ninety-two thousand eight hundred. Just sort of copy some language from one of the others. Okay. Um, on Monday, Carolyn, do you have additional articles? No, I do not. You do? I, I do. Okay. Uh, Christine, you'll have DPW? I most of it, yeah. Okay. Um, other budgets for Monday? We'll have inspections. Yeah, we'll have that one. Okay, additional. Uh, let's see, what do we got left? How about health insurance? Okay. Uh, okay, what I'm going to do is then. Okay. Is there a fund? I mean, I'm just looking for other, so we can make a full night. Uh, Okay, and then what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to run the warrant and feed in as many of the articles there as we can. Uh, Grant, could you get the amounts for uh, water and sewer, the, the water and sewer articles? Okay. You know, just get those dollar amounts, and whether they're from uh, uh, borrowing or grants or whatever, you know, uh, on that. And so, uh, and then we've done that, done collective bargaining, and we're waiting. Okay, so... Uh, on Monday, we'll, we'll run with those and, uh, and see where we are at that point and then run the warrant. Any other business? Okay, meeting adjourned. Thank you.